Okay. <laughs> so welcome back. We have virtually finished up to the end of lecture set eight, which is everything that we need to complete the assignment, which is now due on Wednesday. Um, I want to start the ninth lecture set today, which is on the next set of material, because well, that's obviously the logical step, but also um, it gives us a good chance of getting caught up with the course outline. So up until this point, I've been a little bit behind, uh, but I think by the end of this week, we should be very close to being caught up, which would be ideal um, for obvious reasons. So uh, I'm gonna do a quick review of how a hypothesis test works. So I'm just gonna go over some of the stuff from lecture set eight, um, and then I'll move on into lecture set number nine which is again, hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. But the only difference is that we're gonna be talking about two samples rather than one sample. So for the most part, in the second half of the course, so the post midterm part of the course, we're really just gonna be studying hypothesis testing confidence intervals over and over, but we're going to be changing the situation in which we use them. So we're gonna see roughly five different types of hypothesis tests. And it's just a matter of determining which type of test am I trying to apply in the situation that I'm working with. In lecture set number eight, we discussed one sample hypothesis tests. On assignment number four, there is language in certain parts that'll say things like one mean hypothesis test. That's the same thing as a one sample hypothesis test. It just means that you are conducting your hypothesis test based off of a single sample. So you're only trying to conduct inference about one of the means um, or about one population mean. In lecture set number nine, we're gonna talk about how to deal with two population means. So there's kind of a, a natural extension there. Okay, so uh, just to review the hypothesis testing procedure, I'm going to use uh, the cumulative exercise that's shown on slide 39 of the of lecture set number eight. Okay, so the hypothesis test is a pretty straightforward procedure in that it's the same six steps every single time. The only things that are going to change are the sign in the alternative hypothesis, the formula for the test statistic, and how we look for the p-value or the critical value in the case of the one sample inferential cases. Now, when I do the hypothesis test, I usually check the assumptions first. Um, this isn't, you don't have to do it this way. So for example, there was an email sent out um, that said, do the hypothesis or state the hypotheses in step one. And then on step two, declare the significance level and do the assumptions. This is fine. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. I just tend to do the assumption check first and then I work through the steps of the test. Okay, so following from that email, the first thing that we would do is write down our hypotheses. So Every hypothesis test is going to start with the declaration of the null hypothesis and then the alternative hypothesis. In this class, the null hypothesis is always going to contain an equal then sign. So we're basically starting from the assumption that the population mean is equal to some value. Okay, so in this particular question, we are studying um, the ankle brachial index, the ABI. We're told that a healthy ABI is 0 0.9 or greater. We have a simple random sample of 187 women with a peripheral arterial uh, with peripheral arterial disease and a mean ABI of 0 0.64 with a standard deviation of 0 0.15. Okay, so we're told here we have an SRS of 187 women, so that's the size of the study. The mean of the sample is 0 0.64 with a standard deviation of 0 0.15. So that's telling us that little n is 187, x bar is 0 0.64, and little s is 0 0.15 because it's the standard deviation of the sample, right? Okay, so we're at the 1% significance level. 
and were asked, did the data provide evidence that on average, women with uh, peripheral arterial disease have an unhealthy ABI? So we wanna know if the sample is giving evidence that the average ABI of all women with this disease is unhealthy. So in order for it to be unhealthy, it has to be less than 0.9 because we are told that a healthy ABI is equal to 0.9 or is, or is bigger than that. So we have mu equals 0.9 versus the alternative that mu is less than 0.9. Okay, so that's where we get the alternative from. Okay, on step two, we check the, or we write down our significance level. So we're told to test at the 1% significance level. That's a very easy step. And then we check the assumptions. The first assumption is that we have an SRS. So that's given to us. This would be the same thing as saying that we have a random sample that would also be fine. Then we can check normality. In this case, we are not told directly that the population is normal, but we know that the central limit theorem um, gives us evidence or gives us reason to assume that the um, pop or that the mean, sorry, since we have a sample size of 187, the central limit theorem would apply, which gives us evidence that X bar is approximately normal. So this will be sufficient to complete the test. The last thing is that we don't know the population standard deviation. So therefore we are gonna use a T value. And this is the same um, logic or the same rule that we use with the confidence intervals. So the interval and the test share the same um, decision-making process in terms of whether you use a Z score or a T value. Okay, so then on step three, we compute our T value. Again, we're using a T value because Sigma is unknown. The formula for the t-value is, is effectively identical to the formula for the z-score. The only difference is that we have a little s in the denominator here. So we have t is equal to x bar minus mu zero divided by s over the square root of n. Now we're just plugging in x bar 0 0.64, mu zero 0 0.9, uh, little s is 0 0.15, and the sample size is 187. That gives us a test statistic of negative 23.70. Okay, on step four, we can take either the critical value approach or the p-value approach. They're gonna give the exact same solution. You don't need to do both. Um, there are two, two ways of accomplishing the same goal, which is making a decision about the null hypothesis. Okay, so if we take the critical value approach, we need to find the critical value for the test. Since we're running a lower tail test, our rejection region is going to be in the lower tail of the curve. So again, the alternative hypothesis basically tells us where the rejection region is gonna be located. So since we have a less than test, our rejection region is in the lower tail. So we are looking for a T value that's negative. It has, an area of 0 0.1, 0 0.01 to its left, and it's on 186 degrees of freedom. Okay, so what we do here is we go to the T table. And what we are looking for is 186 DF, so here's our first page. It goes up to 49. Here's our second page. Okay, so this one goes 100, 200, 300. So 186 is between 100 and 200. Whenever we are in between two numbers on the T table, we round down. So regardless of the value, we always round down on the T table. So that means that we are gonna be working with 100 DF in this case. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is match 100 to our significance level, which was 0 0.01. And that gives us 2.364. All right, so that's where the 2.364 comes from. I've rounded down 
always round down when you're between two numbers on the t-table. Okay, so now we can see our critical value is negative 2.364. Our test statistic is negative 23.7. So the test statistic is going to be well inside the rejection region. So we can reject H0 based off of the critical value approach. Okay. If we take the p-value approach, it's a very similar idea, except that we start with the test statistic this time. So the test statistic is negative 23.7. Our p-value is the area to the left of the test statistic because it's a lower tail test. So again, the alternative is telling us where the rejection region is, and it's also telling us where the p-value is. So our p-value is the area below negative 23.7, which is our test statistic. So the p-value is equal to the probability that t is less than negative 23.7. Now, in terms of actually working with this, this is the exact same thing as the probability that T exceeds 23.7. So because the curve is symmetric, we can treat lower tail values in the same way that we treat upper tail values. So for that reason, we can actually just look up this lower tail area in the same way we would look up an upper tail area. So we go to our back to our T table. We're gonna be working with 100 degrees of freedom again because we round down. We're gonna treat this like an upper tail value because the curve is symmetric. So we scroll across the line and we can see that 23.7 is gonna be greater than 2.626. So therefore, the area in the tail is going to be less than 0 0.005. Okay, so that's why we have, since the probability that t is less than negative 23.7 is less than 0 0.005, the p-value is also less than 0 0.005. And any questions so far? We're going to see a lot more examples of p-value finding in, in the same situation and with tables that are built the same. So there's gonna, we're going to get a lot of practice with this. Um, but any questions at this point? No. No. Sorry, the question was, are we going to get doc marks if we have assumptions at the beginning instead of the second step? No. Any questions about the test? Can I ask my question verbally? Yeah. Um, Like different uh, different results, different conclusions. So you, I think you cut out there. It was quiet for a while, and then you just had different results. Okay. Is there any situation where the the p value and the critical value will have different results? No. And different conclusions. No. No. They're always going to agree. So the, there's a question on the the assignment in part B that says if you did it right, then you should get different conclusions. Um, like through a hypothesis and a, not a hypothesis test and a, a confidence interval, not between P and critical. Okay, yeah, so that's different. Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. you, the original question was, are the critical value and the P value going to agree or yeah. a confidence interval and in a hypothesis test? No, you're right, I changed the question halfway through. The first one was P value and critical and the second was hypothesis and confidence. Interesting. I mean, the, the interval should agree with the test as well, but um, 
there might there must be a particular i've only seen one type of formula that leads to a disagreement so that's very strange to hear but uh, i'll take a look at it after we can do assignment questions in a bit i just want to try and get through some material first uh any other questions Okay, so the critical value of the p-value approach as per the question that was just asked are always going to agree. In this case, we can say we're gonna reject because the test statistic is inside the rejection region. So that's based off the critical value approach. Or we can say we're gonna reject because the p-value is less than alpha, which is the significance level. Okay, and then at the end on step six, we have to conclude Hypothesis test conclusions are pretty much always written in the same way. The only thing that changes is the variable that you're talking about and the expression of the alternative. So in this case, because we rejected the null, we are saying that there's evidence that mu is less than 0 0.9. So all we're doing now is expressing that idea. So we would say at the 1% significance level, the data provides sufficient evidence to suggest that the average ABI of women with uh, peripheral arterial disease is less than 0 0.9. That is, this uh, that this population of women have an unhealthy ABI. Okay, so basically, at the percent significance level, we have evidence that the mean is less greater or less than greater than or different from whatever it is we're testing against. Okay, so that's hypothesis testing in the one sample case. So that would be a one mean hypothesis test, basically. What we're going to talk about in lecture set number nine are two sample tests. So in lecture set nine, we're taking what we learned in lecture set seven and eight. We're making a small adjustment to the formula, and we're just using it in a slightly different case. Okay, so this is going to be the assignment five material assignment four was lectures eight or seven slash eight. Okay. And then this is due on Wednesday. November 17 at 8 p.m. now. Okay, so I'm going to start working through lectures at nine, get as far through this as I can, and then um, hopefully we'll have some time left at the end where we can take a few assignment questions. But from the questions that I've been getting and the students that I've been uh, that have been reaching out, it seems like everyone has a pretty good grasp on how to run the tests and whatnot. It's mainly just some of the conceptual things like the question about P Z greater than T versus P Z greater than Z and a couple of other little conceptual things. So hopefully we'll be able to talk about those at the end of the lecture. All right, so in lecture set nine, we are taking, <clears throat> yeah, so again, you don't have to do the P value and the critical value approach. You can take they're going to always agree. So you can choose which one you're going to use unless the question specifically states use this. But I will continue to show you both ways throughout the example so that you have examples of both. Um, okay, so in lecture set nine, again, what we're doing is we're taking the confidence interval material and the hypothesis test material. And we are extending it to a case where we now have two population means. So in lecture set seven and lecture set eight, we learned how to construct a confidence interval and a hypothesis test for one mean. Okay, so for those are inferential procedures for a single population mean. Now what we are doing is we are going to learn how to construct an interval 
and a hypothesis test when we have two population means. Okay. Now, the nice thing about this is that the interval and the test work in the exact same way. So the interval is still a three-step procedure and the hypothesis test is still a six-step procedure. The only difference is step one and step three. So the alternative or the null and the alternative hypotheses will look very slightly different and the test statistic formula will be slightly different. Outside of that, everything is done in the exact same way. So again, this is a very kind of repetitive part of the course where we're gonna be seeing the same material just in slightly different situations. All right, so again, I've already kind of explained what we're gonna be studying, but we started with one mean, now we're gonna be working with two means. So we're just going from one to two. So we're gonna have two samples instead of one sample. So this would be like two mean inference instead of one mean inference. Um, okay, sorry, just before I move on, when we're running two population inference for two population means, what we do is we just talk about the difference between the means. So the procedures that we're going to see today and probably a bit on Thursday are based around the quantity mu one minus mu two. So instead of running a hypothesis test about mu equal to some number, we're gonna run a test about mu one minus mu two equal to some number, right? So it's just a very slight extension from what we saw before. Okay, our confidence interval and our hypothesis test in the one sample case, the formulas for those basically followed from what we learned about the sampling distribution of X bar. So in lecture set number six, we studied the sampling distribution of X bar. We showed that the mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean, and the standard deviation of the sample means was equal to sigma over the square root of N. And then basically what we did is we just took those, those formula or those um, properties and we utilize them within our confidence interval formula and our test statistic formula. So in order to build the confidence interval and the hypothesis test for two population means, we would need to know the sampling distribution of X bar one minus X bar two. Okay. So again, in the, in the single mean case, we showed the following properties. So mu X bar is mu, sigma X bar is equal to sigma over the square root of N. If we do not have sigma, we can replace it with little s and we just get the standard error of X bar. And that is what we use um, when we're running a t-test or building a confidence interval based off the t-distribution. Okay, we want to now make a statement about mu one minus mu two. Okay, so the goal is to study this quantity. Okay, so we want to say, or we want to ask questions like, is mu one bigger than mu two? Is mu one less than mu two? Are mu one and mu two different from each other? So our same standard uh, questions, but just a comparison, <coughs> a comparison between mu one and mu two. Okay, so we know that for one population mean, we can use the sample mean as a point estimate of that value. So X bar is a point estimator for mu. So if we wanna study mu one minus mu two, we're going to use X bar one minus X bar two. So we're gonna have two samples of information we're gonna compute the mean from each sample 
And we're gonna use the difference between those sample means to conduct inference about the difference between the population means. Okay, so again, in lecture sets seven and eight, we had one sample, we computed the sample mean from that sample, and then we use that to build an interval or conduct a hypothesis test about mu. Now we're gonna have two samples. We're gonna take a mean from each sample, subtract them and use that to discuss the difference between mu one and mu two. Okay, so to construct the interval or build the test statistic, we need to know the sampling distribution of X bar one minus X bar two. Okay, well, these formula or these properties extend pretty naturally from the single sample case. So here you can see the mean of the sample mean difference is just mu one minus mu two. So this is the same idea. Okay, so compare to mu x bar equals mu. So in the single mean case, we had mu x bar equals mu. Now we're just saying mu of x bar one minus x bar two is mu one minus mu two, right? So just the difference between the means. And here we have the standard deviation of sample mean difference. And then we can compare this to which is the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So we can compare that to sigma x bar, which we knew or which we know is sigma over the square root of n. And now you can see here that sigma, so the standard deviation of the difference is the square root of sigma one squared over n one plus sigma two squared over n two. Okay. So basically we're just taking the information from the two samples and putting it together. That's how this works. So we just have very slight differences in the formula that we're using. Okay, if sigma one and sigma two are unknown, we just replace them with the sample standard deviations and that gives us the standard error. So the same idea as before. Now, these formula, specifically in the case where sigma is known, these are the parameters of the sampling distribution of x bar one minus x bar two. And you can always use these formula to find the mean of the population mean differences. So this is, these are analogous effect, or these work in the exact same way as the formula that we learned in lecture set six for one mean. We're just slightly extending it to the case where we have two populations that are of interest. But we can always use these formula to find the population mean of the differences between the sample means and the standard deviation between the sample mean differences as well. Okay. When we are when we are conducting um, inference about two population means, we are going to have a set of assumptions that we need to use that we need to check before we run the interval or the test. These assumptions are exactly the same as they were in the one sample case, except that we have to do them for both populations separately. So. We require from each population that we've collected independent, simple random samples. So population one gives us a random sample, population two gives us a random sample, and those samples are independent of one another. So they're not related values. 
we require that each population is normally distributed. And if we have sigma one and sigma two, we can use a Z score. If we do not have sigma one and sigma two, we use a T value. So same ideas as in uh, lecture set seven and eight, except we have to check for each population separately since we are working with two populations now. Okay, now in terms of the normality assumption, this is gonna be checked in the same way that it was checked before. So we have two populations and we're collecting two samples. If the two populations are normally distributed, then the samples are normally distributed or the, the values from the sample came from a normal distribution. So the sample means will be normal. If we don't know the shape of the population, but both samples are larger than 30, then we can apply the central limit theorem to each population. So again, everything is exactly the same as it was before. We just are doubling up and we have to check it for each population now. All right, so formally, if we want to build a confidence interval about mu1 minus mu2, we use the same three steps that we used before. On step, well, after we check the assumptions, on step one, if sigma is if sigma one and sigma two are known, we use a z-score. If sigma one and sigma two are unknown, we use a t-value. And the formulas for the interval are now given on step two. So step one is exactly the same. Step two, we have a slight alteration to our confidence interval formula because we are now working with two samples rather than one sample. And then on step three, we just interpret the interval again. In the case that we have two independent populations, which is the first set of um, material that we're studying, the degree of freedom is now the smaller of n1 minus one and n2 minus one. Okay, so we're just taking the minimum or the smaller value of the two sample sizes and subtracting one. Our hypothesis test is running the same six steps as it was before. On step one, after we check the assumptions, or you can check the assumptions on step two, we state the null and the alternative hypotheses. I'm gonna show you what these look like momentarily. Um, very slight alteration because we're working with two population means. On step two, we declare significance level, same as before. Step three, compute the test statistic. So again, same idea here in terms of Z versus T, slight alteration to the formula because we're working with two means rather than one. Then on step four, everything is the same as it was before, critical value or p-value approach. Step five, decision about h naught. Step six, conclusion. For comparing two population means, we have three different tests. Uh, Two-tail test, upper tail test, lower tail test. The same as before. H naught and H A for these tests can be written in one of two ways. On slide 11, I give one way that we can write it. So here I have in the two tail test, H zero mu one minus mu two equals zero versus H A mu one minus mu two is not equal to zero. This would be the same thing as writing mu one equals mu two versus H A mu one does not equal mu two. Okay, so these are equivalent expressions. So you can use either expression. It means the same thing. The only difference is with the first expression. So mu one minus mu two equal to zero. You can see the value that you're going to plug into the test statistic because it's showing you the zero um in the expression okay so we can write it either way the same thing with these tests 
So we can go mu1 equals mu2 versus ha. Mu1 is greater than mu2. Or we can go mu1 equals mu2 versus ha mu1 less than mu2. So these are all equivalent. So in each case, you can write the null and the alternative in either way. Any questions? Okay, so now we're gonna to start to look at some examples. Obviously, examples help, right? So um, the first example is just a very basic example just to illustrate how the formulas are gonna work and how we're gonna run both of the tests or run the test and build the interval. Then I'll have a second example that's a little more detailed. Okay, so for in the first example, we have the summary statistics below are for two independent samples uh, collected from two normally distributed populations. Part A says construct a 95% CI from mu1 minus mu2. Part B says test whether or not mu1 is different from mu2 when alpha equals 0 0.05. And part C asks us to compare the solutions. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll start off by checking the assumptions. Now, the assumptions for part A and part B are going to be exactly the same. So we only have to do this once. Okay, so we can think of it like an assumption check. Actually, I'll write these up here. So we're going to have our assumptions for population one. OK, so we'll have SRS, normality, sigma one, known. Right, and then we'll have the same thing for population two. SRS, normality, sigma two, no, right? Okay, so we are told that we have two independent samples collected from normally distributed populations. Let's just make this really straightforward for us so that we can move through and look at the illustrations. We're just going to say two independent SRS collected from each population, right? So this is good, and this is good. We're told that the populations are normal, so this is good, and this is good. And then from the table, we are given little s instead of sigma, so we don't have sigma 1, and we don't have sigma 2. Okay, so that's fine. It just means that we're using a T value rather than a Z score. Same as before. Okay, so step one, we're gonna build a 95% CI. Okay, so we're gonna first determine our degree of freedom. So the degrees of freedom here is gonna be the minimum of N1 minus one versus N2 minus one. This is going to be the minimum of 16 versus 21. So the degrees of freedom here is 16. Okay. So our T value is going to be on alpha over 2, comma DF. In this case, um, 
we're building a 95% CI. So we're going to have a T on 0 0.05 over 2 and 16. This is a T value on 0 0.025 and 16. So now we're just going to look up our T value. And you can see that this is done. This is exactly the same as what we had in the one sample case. It's just that our degree of freedom had a slightly different formula because we're comparing the two means. Okay, so we go to our T table. We have 16 degrees of freedom, 0 0.025. So our T value is 2.120. Okay. okay. So now on step two, we're going to build our confidence interval. So we have x bar one minus x bar two plus or minus t alpha over two df multiplied by the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Okay, so this is going to give us 3.03 minus 3.57 plus or minus T 0 0.025.16 multiplied by uh, 3 point or 0 0.084 over 17. So that's going to be negative 0 0.54 plus or minus 2.120 multiplied by the square root of 0 0.0010694. So that's going to give us negative 0 0.54 plus or minus 2.120 multiplied by 0 0.0327.0481, which is negative 0 0.54 plus or minus 0 0.0699, sorry, 6933342. And then we end up with negative 0 0.6092, 0 0.0. 0 Right, so hopefully what you're noticing here is for the most part, this is exactly the same as what we saw in lecture set seven. The only difference is that, again, we're working with two population means rather than one. So we're working with two samples rather than one. So the formulas have just adjusted slightly to accommodate that second sample of information. But in terms of actually working through the process of building the interval, it's not that different except the accommodation of that second set of information. All right. And then on step three, we have to give our conclusion. So this is going to be, uh, this is going to work pretty much in the same way as it did before as well, except that we're talking about two means rather than one. So we're going to say we are 95% confident that the 
difference between mu1 and mu2 is between negative 0 0.609 and negative 0 0.471. Any questions? Okay, so in part B, we're now going to run a hypothesis test. So it says test whether or not mu1 is different from mu2 when alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Okay, so here we're going to have mu1 minus mu2 equals 0 versus HA mu1 minus mu2 does not equal 0. Okay, again, this is equivalent. So if you would prefer, this is the same thing as writing the null and the alternative in as it's shown in red here. Okay, so those expressions are exactly the same. On step two, we declare the significance level. We would also state the assumptions. For this test, we wrote the assumptions in part A. They're exactly the same. So the assumptions are given at the beginning of this exercise. OK, so now in step three, we're going to compute the test statistic. So we're just going to have a slightly different formula here because we're talking about two population means. So we're going to have t is x bar 1 minus x bar 2, minus mu 1, minus mu 2, divided by the square root s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. OK, so this is going to be negative, or sorry, 3.03 .03 minus 3.57 minus 0. So notice mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0. That's why the first expression of the null hypothesis is a little bit easier to work with, because it's actually saying h0 mu1 minus mu2 equals 0. And that's the 0 that we're plugging in here. OK, and then here we're going to have 0 0.084 squared over 17 plus 0 0.12 squared over 22. Okay. So that's going to be negative 0 0.54 divided by 0 0.032704891. And that gives us negative 16.511. All right. OK, so now on step four, we can take the critical value approach or the p-value approach. And the nice thing is that from this point forward, the test works in exactly the same way as it did before. So there's no um, like adjustments that we have to make to the p-value or the critical value approach these are going to run in the same way that we learned about in lecture set eight. It was only really the test statistic and the null and alternative that changed. 
to accommodate the second mean. So here we'll have critical value. Okay, so we can start by sketching out our T curve. Okay, so that's going to be centered at zero. We're using a, a two tailed test. So we're going to have T alpha over two degree of freedom here. And then we'll have negative T alpha over two DF here. Okay. So this value is going to be 0 0.025 and 16 for the same reasons that we discussed before. So this is the exact same value that we used in the confidence interval. So we now have this similarity between the critical value for the hypothesis test and the critical value for the confidence interval. So they're identical, same degree of freedom, same uh, significance level. Okay, so that means that the lower value is just gonna be the negative. So here's our rejection region. Our test statistic is negative 16.51. So here we have T is equal to negative Okay, so if we take the p-value approach, we're going to mark down our test statistic. Okay, and then we also consider the upper tail because it's a double-sided test. Okay, so here we're going to have the p-value is equal to probability that t is less than negative 16.511 plus the probability that t is greater than 16.511. This is two times the probability that t is greater than 16.511. Okay, so now we go to our t table. We are working with 16 degrees of freedom. Our test statistic is 16.511. So that value is going to be over here, right? So we are to the left, or sorry, to the right of the largest listed value. So 16.511 is bigger than 2.921. So therefore, the area to the right of 16.511 is going to be bigger than 0 0.005. And therefore, the area to the left of negative 16.511 is going to be less than 0 0.005. So we can say here, oh, sorry. Since the probability that T is bigger than 16.511 is less than 0 0.005, then the P value is less than 0 0.01. Okay, so then on step five, Regardless of which approach we take, critical value or p-value, we're going to reject. So if we take the critical value approach, the test statistic is clearly in the rejection region, so we can reject. If we take the p-value approach, the um, p-value is clearly less than the significance level, so we can reject. So regardless of which approach we take, we're going to be able to reject the null here. 
which again, they're always going to agree. And then on step six, we can say at the 5% significance level, the data provide sufficient evidence to suggest that mu1 and mu2 are different. Any questions? Okay, in part C, it asks us to compare um, the two conclusions. So we wanna compare the interval and the hypothesis test. Now, basically the point here is since the interval and the test use the same critical value. Okay, so since the confidence interval and hypothesis test use the same critical value, the conclusions will agree. Okay, so we can see the 95% CI was negative 0 0.609 to negative 0 0.471, okay? So this does not contain zero, okay? The 5% two-sided test rejected H0. Right. So this is basically saying evidence that mu one minus mu two equals zero. Right. Or sorry, evidence that mu one minus mu two does not equal zero. So these conclusions agree with each other. So the interval and the test are giving us the exact same result. They're both giving us evidence that the difference between mu1 and mu2 is not zero. The interval is showing us directly that zero is not, or we are not confident that zero is a value between mu1 and mu2. And the, uh, the hypothesis test is showing us the same conclusion. It's just giving us evidence that mu1 minus mu2 does not equal zero because we rejected the null that they are the same. Okay, so whenever we run an interval and a hypothesis test that use the same critical value, their results will always agree. Any questions?
All right. <clears throat> Second example. Several neurosurgeons want to determine whether a dynamic system reduced the number of uh, reduced the number of accurate post-operative days in the hospital relative to a static system. Consider the information given below. Okay, so we have the data for the dynamic system and we have the data for the static system. So we have sample sizes of varying size. We have our summary statistics for each. In part A, it says, assuming all assumptions are intact, did the data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean number of acute post-operative days in hospital is smaller with the dynamic system than with the static system at the 5% significance level. Okay, so what we are running here is a hypothesis test to determine if the average number of days spent in hospital is less with the dynamic system than the static system. So we wanna know if there's evidence that the mean number of days you spend in hospital after surgery when you take when you have when you're subscribed to the dynamic system is less than the mean number of days you spend in hospital after surgery if you're subscribed to the static system so we have h0 mu dynamic minus mu static equals zero versus ha mu dynamic minus mu static less than zero, right? And this is the same thing again as mu D equals mu S versus H A mu D less than mu S, right? Those are equivalent statements. Okay, on step two, we state our significance level so 0 0.05. And then on step three, we compute our test statistic. So we have two, we're running a two sample test. So this is gonna be X bar one, or sorry, X bar D minus X bar S minus mu D minus mu S over the square root SD squared over little nd plus SS squared over little ns. Okay, so this is going to be 7.36 minus 10.50 minus 0 divided by the square root of 1.22 squared over. Fourteen plus four point five nine squared over six. Okay, so this is going to give us negative three point one four divided by one point nine zero two zero one six, which is negative 1.651. Okay, so that's our test statistic in this uh, situation. Ah, not enough room. We stink time. <laughs> almost done, almost done, almost done. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, just like before, we can take critical value or p-value approach. Again, hopefully you can see that this is all very similar. It's really just setting up the test and then the test statistic that are different. I didn't check the assumptions here because we are told um, in the question, 
assuming all assumptions are intact, but they would be the same as what we saw in the previous illustration as well. Okay, so then on step four, if we take the critical value approach, okay, so we're gonna have a negative T value on alpha comma DF. So we're running a lower tail test. So we don't divide the significance level by two here. All of the information is going to be in the lower tail. So this is going to be T 0 0.05. And then our degree of freedom is gonna be the smaller. Okay, so the DF is gonna be the minimum N1 minus one n2 minus 1, which is the minimum of 13 versus 5. So that's going to be 5. OK, so now we're looking up a t value on 0 0.05 and 5. Okay, so we have 2.015. Okay, and then you can see here, our test statistic is not gonna get into the rejection region. And then, okay, perfect, lots of room. Then if we take the p-value approach, sketch our curve. Okay, so we're gonna mark down where our test statistic is located. It's a lower tail test. So here, the p value is equal to the probability that t is less than negative 1.651. Okay, so this is going to be equivalent to the probability that t is greater than 1.651, right? So these are the same value because of the symmetry of the curve. So we can go to our t table. We have five degrees of freedom. We can see that 1.651 is in between 1.476 and 2.015. So therefore the p-value is going to be between Okay, so therefore the p-value is going to be between 0 0.1 and 0 0.05. Okay, so here we have since 0 0.05 is less than the probability that t is greater than 1.65 is less than 0 0.01. That's not correct. then 0 0.1, oh my God, Brian, sorry. There we go. 0 0.1 is greater than P value is greater than 0 0.05. OK. 
Okay. Uh, any questions? All right, I'll just plop. Okay, so on step five, if we take the, uh, we didn't, okay, so why didn't I divide the significance level by two? I didn't divide the significance level by two because it's a one-tailed test. So we only divide the significance level by two if it's a two-sided test. So here, this is a one-sided test. So when we run one-sided tests, we don't divide the significance level into both tails. We only do that when we have a um, the does not equal sign in the alternative. Make sense? Um, okay, so on step five, if we take the critical value approach, you can see the test statistic is not in the rejection region, so we do not reject. The p-value is somewhere between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1. Okay, so the p-value is in between these two quantities. There, anything inside that range is bigger than alpha, right? So alpha is 0 0.05, so this is telling us that the p-value is bigger than 0 0.05 and less than 0 0.1. Who the hell is this guy? Okay, so we uh, do not reject H0. Some guys just like snow blowing my driveway. I have no idea who this person is. Very strange. Okay. Friendly neighborhood, I guess. Yeah. Scared the crap out of me because the snow just flew over the window and I looked outside and this guy's just like having a time. I guess first snowfall, bust out the, the gear. I'm just going to hack it out with a shovel like a loser. Never. That's what I th I think. First snowfall, he just wants to let her rip. He's gonna do the whole. I hope he's like gonna do the road. <laughs> just, ah. Okay, sorry, distracted. Let me just finish this up and then I'll stop rambling. Okay, so we can say at the five percent. significance level, the data do not provide sufficient evidence to suggest that the mean number of how does it do this? Of uh, post operative days spent in hospital on the dynamic 
system um, are less than that spent on the static system, right? So basically at the 5% significance level, there's no evidence to suggest that you spend less time in hospital on the dynamic system compared to the static system. So we have no evidence to suggest that these values are different or in particular that the mean time spent on the stat on the dynamic is less than that on the static. Um, any questions? <laughs> okay, so I'll stop here for today. So on Thursday, I'll finish up this example. And then we're going to talk about two sample testing when the samples are dependent. So um, the second set of examples in this lecture set are is again just a hypothesis test confidence interval, but the structure of the data changes the formulas that we utilize. So it's the same goals and the same general process, but now it's how the values from each sample are related to each other that changes um, the formulas that we are utilizing. Okay, so we'll talk about that on Thursday. And then hopefully start the first half of lectures at 10 and be pretty close to um, being caught up with that outline. We're actually not far behind at all now. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so a um, few minutes left. I'll stop um, with the lecture set material for today. And if anyone has any questions about the assignment, I'll hang around uh, for about five, 10 minutes. And then I also have office hours at one o'clock if anyone has any other questions. Okay, so have a good one if you're taking off and I will talk to you on Thursday.